Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 29th, 2019, and my guest is psychologist and author Gerd Gigerenzer. He is director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. Our topic for today is his work on decision-making, rationality, and rules of thumb, including his 2008 book, Gut Feelings, the Intelligence of the Unconscious. Gerd, welcome to EconTalk. I'm glad to be there. So let's start with what you mean by gut feelings and how it's possible, which on the surface they seem irrational or not analytical. How could that possibly uh, – how could they possibly help us make uh, better decisions than a, a <laughs> rational calculating approach? Yeah. So let's first be clear what I mean with gut feelings. So a gut feeling or an intuition – is based on years of experience and it has the following features. It usually is quickly in your mind, so you know what you might do, but you can't explain why. Nevertheless, it guides much of our personal and also professional decisions. So a gut feeling is not something arbitrary. It's not a sixth sense. And it's also not what women have. Men also have gut feelings. There is a suspicion around gut feelings uh, that is uh, widespread in the social sciences uh, that they would always be second best and misleading. Hmm? The problem is, uh, if one would not listen to one's gut, that means to the experience that's stored in the brain or in those parts of the brain who can talk, uh, then one would lose lots of important information. And yet, in most treatments of decision making, and you refer to this many times in your book, um, you think you call it the, the, the Franklin approach, approach, Benjamin Franklin, Franklin making a list of pros and cons. My favorite example of it is the Charles Darwin list of why he should get married or stay single. Uh, a rational person, an enlightened person, a thoughtful thinking person shouldn't rely on those unseen, unconscious intuitions. They could always do better by doing a cost-benefit analysis or can we? Yeah. That's not true. Um, it's important to distinguish between a world where you can calculate the risks and other situations where you can't do that. So if you can calculate the risk, that would be the case if you play the roulette or a lottery, hmm? where all probabilities are known, where all possible outcomes are known and all consequences are known. Then better calculate. But in many situations of the world, there's uncertainty where you cannot know the probability, not even estimate them. And also, moreover, you can't know all the possible future states of the world. So if you want to invest, if you want to find out whom to marry, if you decide who, what professor to hire, these are all situations of uncertainty. And... Precise calculations are an illusion in this situation. What's useful is heuristics that's robust, so rules uh, of thumb that have a good chance to hit as opposed to a uh, calculation that overfits the past. So I want to warn listeners that I love this book and I love the way that that you, Gerd, look at these issues. So I am very prone, as I am often not, I am very prone to accept all of your claims as, well, of course, that makes sense. Uh, that's a good study, another good study, and there's some more confirming evidence. So I, I have a natural inclination 
uh, being trained as a particular kind of economist to be very skeptical of behavioral economics and some of the claims of irrationality that have been put forward in recent years by behavioral economists and others. And so I, I'm going to try to fight it, but I have to say I find that uh, approach that you've they've just laid out extremely uh, compelling. It pushes uh, so many of my uh, happy happy places. Um, so I want to take an example, um, uh, and my wife is a, a school teacher, and at times she's been an administrator, and she talks about the challenges of hiring a a new faculty member, and she was very affected by uh, Kahneman's. Uh, book Thinking Fast and Slow because her for many years she and her colleagues she felt had relied on gut feelings they had said wow you know that was such a great presentation uh, they get wowed by it by the say the charisma of a teacher and she argued pretty persuasively to me at least that when you're hiring a teacher it's much better to take a set of categories scale things from one to five get away from your gut and Force your decision-making process to be more analytical than just uh, that one wow factor that might overwhelm everything else. And yet you suggest that that's maybe not so so advantageous. Why? No. Uh, first, intuition or gut feelings is not the opposition of um, getting information. Typically, it's very useful to uh, look for information, to read through the CV of the applicants. To, uh, but in many situations at the end, uh, the numbers that you find there don't tell you the answer. And uh, I've worked with experience people who do personal selection. They do exactly that. They get informed, but then they talk to the person and develop a kind of feeling about the person. And at the end, a gut decision is always one that started out with evidence. But if the evidence doesn't tell you, then you listen to your guts. And listening to your guts makes only sense if you have years of experience. So that means all the information is there. But it's uh, in a way in our brain that you can explain it. So my wife, uh, my wife knows she's a sucker for charisma, and so she automatically discounts that dramatically. So that would be yeah. an example of how, over time, you learn about what your maybe weak spots are, yeah. and and you get better. But but doesn't Kahneman claim uh, and find in research that he has done that I think it was the Israeli Air Force that when they went and used a very mechanical process for for hiring pilots for the Air Force, they did better than just th- than their gut. Are you suggesting that that was misleading or that they used other gut intuition on top of it or that you should? So the, uh, the executives I've worked with in uh, doctors in medicine, businessmen in many areas, they are looking and searching to the information. And at the end, it's often a gut decision. So it's not an opposition. And to give you an example. I have worked with some of the largest uh, companies on the stock market worldwide and asked the executives, uh, think about your last uh, 10 important uh, professional decisions where you participated or which you made by yourself. How many of them were at the end a gut decision? So the emphasis is at the end. Yeah? And... Uh, the typically answer in these corporations were 50%. So every other decision is at the end a gut decision. But the same executives would not dare to say this in public because there is anxiety, yeah. because there is little tolerance in the public and part because of this type of uh, yeah, is psychology and behavioral economics literature that assumes that intuition is always second best. It's not true. And that can be shown experimentally. For instance, uh, some dear colleagues of mine have shown that uh, in sports, so for instance, if you uh, instruct a 
a golf player, an experienced golf player, to make the putt quickly, so in less than three seconds, as opposed to let the person more time, what do you think? Which one will hit more often? It's the less than three second. So it's where you have little time and don't to pay attention. But it only holds for experienced people. It doesn't hold for beginners. And this kind of distinction have been gotten lost in this kind of crusade against intuition. That is now uh, basically the definition of behavioral economics. I would wish that behavioral economics would get out of this uh, idea that uh, their goal is to explain what, how people deviate from homo economicus. Homo economicus is anyhow an unrealistic person, and every economist would admit to that. Behavioral economists have taken that too seriously. Yeah, it's a, it's a straw man that um, it drives me crazy. It reminds me of a story that I've told a few times on here when talking about value at risk, a technique for a very sophisticated, mm -hmm. quote, scientific, statistically driven <laughs> mathematical technique for evaluating the riskiness of a portfolio that led people badly astray during the financial crisis of 2008. Yeah. And a friend of mine, wonderful, bright person in the investment world said, well, you know, what's the alternative? It's the best we have. And I said, the alternative is to use intuition, which is what we had for most of human history. The advantage of intuition is that it doesn't lull you into thinking you know what you're doing if you're careful. Yeah. Value at risk is – the risk of value at risk is that you might actually think you understand the risk and you forget the assumptions of the program that allow you to come up with a, a, an actual number. And people say, oh, I won't forget. But human nature is such that people do forget and they get overconfident. Uh, so value at risk would be a great tool if finance, the world of finance, would be predictable. That is in a world of risk where you know everything and can calculate it. No surprises, nothing unexpected that can happen. But the, the real world of finance is not one of calculable risk, it's one of high uncertainty. And uh, value at risk, just to give you an idea, hmm? uh, the calculations done, uh, uh, so the calculation that a large bank has to do to calculate its value at risk uh, involve estimating thousands of risk parameters and their correlations, which amounts to uh, millions of correlations, are based on five years, 10 years data that borders on astrology. This is not science. And we have seen that a value at risk calculation have not prevented any crisis. So in a world of high uncertainty, we need to have simple methods that are robust. And uh, value at risk calculations they also foster the, an illusion of certainty that one would mean that this precise number that one had calculated is really the true value. I work with the Bank of England, with Andy Haldane, who is the chief economist, on uh, getting uh, the at least the regulators to change these complicated risk assessment tools into simpler so-called heuristics, like fast and frugal trees, where uh, what's being done gets transparent. And also uh, where the, uh, the regulators can see what the banks are doing. If a bank estimates millions of covariances, there's no way a, uh, a regulator can find out yeah, where the twisting and tinkering. And banks can also use their own internal model. That's not a model of safety. Banks will always try to find a way around the calculations. But if, and try to game it, but if it's just as maybe three variables that are uh, used in such a, uh, maybe a fast and frugal tree, like the leverage ratio, and 
a few others are liquidity measure, then uh, gaming is not as easy. Explain, so explain, explain yeah. what you mean by a fast and frugal tree, which is a really uh, useful heuristic of yeah. heuristics, I think. So a fast and frugal tree is like a decision tree, but much more simpler. You start with uh, a certain uh, feature, and that could be the leverage ratio. If the leverage ratio is higher, of a bank is higher than a certain threshold dweller, then it gets a red flag. So the, that's it. And not even anything else is looked up. If it's, it is not higher, it's lower, then a second question is asked, and this is the way it proceeds. So a fast and frugal tree is, uh, doesn't make any trade-offs. So it's like a, a body. Yeah? So if you, if you have a failing heart, then a good kidney doesn't help you much. So it's not like a linear equ equation where it, everything compensates with everyone. And we have tested this fast and frugal trees in many situations. And meanwhile, they are used in medicine and in many other areas. And uh, also what's very important is that a doctor using such a fast and frugal tree or a banker or a central banker can actually understand <laughs> what's happening. So I want to use an example you take from the book because I, it really um, is profound um, and it connected to a number of things we've talked about here on the program. I, I, I want to start with an observation that comes from um, the book Ending Medical Reversal by Adam Sifu and Vinay Prasad. Uh, I interviewed Adam about the book, um, and Vinay Prasad is scheduled to be a guest coming in the future talking about a different book. But they come up with a very profound and disturbing discovery, which is when you look at observational studies, that is looking back at what has happened to people with different characteristics who, say, adopted a medical intervention, this intervention looks very, very good, and so it gets adopted by the profession. After a while – Time passes, and it's, there's an opportunity to do a, a randomized control trial. Uh, and instead of relying on statistical techniques to control for the differences between people or, say, the selection of who ended up being uh, chosen for the intervention in observations, we now actually have a random sample of two different groups. And it's shockingly depressing how often the randomized control trial fails to find efficacy and, in fact, often finds harm from the intervention that looked good in an observational study. Now, you find something quite similar. It doesn't seem so at first, but here's what the example you have in the book. A, um, a patient comes into the emergency room, has chest pain. What should we do? Should we send them home? Should we uh, put them into the coronary unit? Should we put them into the intensive care unit? And you talk about this fancy study that was done with, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 different pieces of information. Each one had an associated probability attached to it. And doctors were given a card, which is – it's hard to say it without laughing. And, and we're told, use a calculator and just do a weighted average of these probabilities after you've made the assessment and then uh, decide where to put the person, whether to put them in the coronary unit, in the ICU, or send them home. And you said what you showed – and this is just extraordinary. I don't know if it would hold as generally as the uh, finding of any medical reversal. But what you show is that the fancy technique – works best in explaining the past. It's very good at assigning people ex post after they've already uh, gone through the system and we evaluate. In fact, the numbers come from the, the data are fitted using these variables that, that we've come up with to figure out what's the best place to put people. Unfortunately, going forward, it does not do so well. And in fact, the simple rule of thumb that you just described, the fast and frugal tree, looking at, say, three factors instead of the 25 with and looking at them sequentially, not weighting them in the fancy way, actually does better going forward. And that's an extraordinary, and I think, incredibly important finding. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it is correct. Um, fancy, complicated methods work best in explaining the past. And in situations of uncertainty – which is usually the case when you do predict, then you need to scale back, need to make it simpler. And the tools that 
uh, we have developed, like fast and frugal trees, they are used by doctors to make uh, decisions about life and death, such as whether a patient who is rushed into the hospital with chest and pain should be sent into the coronary care unit or in a regular bed with telemetry. And uh, this uh, fast and frugal tree can do better than, uh, in that case, a logistic regression. Now, it not only can do better, but also the doctors can actually understand it. There are very few doctors who understand what a logistic regression is. And the fast and frugal tree is also um, immediately, it can be changed. If the patient population changes, doctors can adapt it which is very hard, is a logistic regression. In general, under uncertainty, predicting the future, you are well advised to make it simple. If you want to explain the past, make it complicated. But the key there, I think, is that you're not really explaining the past. You're having yeah. an illusion that you're explaining the past yeah. because the data fits well. And as you point out, this is really in cases where even after you've taken account of all the variables, you may only be able to explain maybe half of the variation in outcomes. But in that case, you're in the, under the illusion you've explained the past because you're really fundamentally in that case, assuming that correlation is causation when it is not. And that's, you know, that's the way I took – that's my takeaway from your explanation for how it's possible that it doesn't do better going forward. A lot of what it's picking up is noise rather than signal. Mm. And it's actually yeah. uh, deceiving you as to whether you've understood what's going on. Yeah. So in general, uh, the difference is between data fitting. So you have the data and you fit model on that. And many studies, also in economics, stop there and report a great uh, fit or R square. The proof is in prediction whether that model that fits so wonderfully actually predicts. And uh, there is a statistical theories like the bias variance uh, dilemma, which uh, where one can understand that in prediction, you're better to make it simpler. And these are usually what heuristics are. Heuristics have a bias, so they are simple, you can't have many free parameters to fit them. But they reduce the error, what's called by variance. That means overfitting. They're not fine-tuning on the past. And fine-tuning on the past only pays if the future is like the past. That's in a situation of risk, but not under uncertainty. And as you point out, with a different population, the past on that old population is not necessarily going to be like the future of the new one. And I think so many of the the economics Nobel Prize was just given to three economists for their work in randomized control trials. It's an interesting in, in the area of economic development. It's an interesting technique, and I think it's been greatly oversold in a certain sense, which is that a lot, many of the findings which are in RCTs, randomized control trials, which is the so-called gold standard yeah. – um, don't seem to hold up so well to, with a different yeah. population, with a larger sample in a different yeah. country. And that's because mm -hmm. there's too much going on. You really can't – that's not going to be the same in the future going forward as it was in the past where you ran the experiment. Yeah, that's correct. So what I'm studying is what are those simple heuristics that just look at a few variables in order to deal with these huge amounts of uncertainty? One example uh, I would like to give you is uh, Google flu trends. You may recall that Google tried to prove that big data analytics can predict the spread of the flu. And it was mm -hmm. hailed with fanfares all around the world when they published a Nature article in 2008 or nine. And so they had done everything right. So they had uh, fitted four years of data and then tested uh, data means they had about five, 50 million search terms and then 
uh, they had maybe 100,000 of algorithms that I tried and took the best one and I'd also tested it in, in the following year and then they made predictions. And here we are really under uncertainty. Uh, the flu is hard to control and people's search terms are also hard to control. And what happened? Something unexpected. Namely, the swine flu came in 2009. While Google flu trends, the algorithm had learned that flu is high in winter and low in summer, mm -hmm. the swine flu came in the summer. Mm -hmm. So it uh, started early in April or so and had its peak late in September. And of course, the algorithm failed because it fine-tuned on the past and couldn't know that. Now, the Google engineers... Uh, revised the algorithm. By the way, the algorithm it was a secret, a business secret. We only know that it had 45 variables and probably was a linear algorithm. Now, uh, in our research, what we, what I would do is now realize you are under answer. They make it simpler. No, the Google engineers had the idea if a complex algorithm fails, make it more complex. It's it's, just like, you didn't have enough variables. Yes, you yes. Had a, a cubic term or a quadratic term. And they changed it to 160 variables, so up from 45, and made predictions for Better. four years. It didn't do well, and then they silently, without fanfare, buried it. So um, I'm just writing a, a, a book on machine learning and fast and frugal heuristics, focusing on fast and frugal trees and so. And um, we have asked ourselves, what would be the most simple heuristic you can think about hmm, to predict the spread of the flu, precisely the flu-related doctor visits? Now think for a moment. So a heuristic that doesn't need big data, a heuristic that doesn't need 50 million search terms, that doesn't need to test 100,000 models, and actually has something that can be uh, a variable that can be easily found by everyone. So one of the uh, features that humans use to make prediction under uncertainty is recency. They're looking for the thing that happened last of the time because you can trust the very far past. And the most recent information about uh, flu-related doctor visits is from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, Two, about two weeks ago. So we used the two weeks ago variable and only this one variable and nothing else and set up a heuristic. The flu-related doctor visits in a region are the same as those two weeks ago. That's an absolutely simple heuristic. And then we tested it on the entire four years of the, um, the revised uh, where the revised Google flu trends algorithm was. And what do you think? How well did it do? It predicted better. Since you're going to tell me, better. I'm pretty, <laughs> since I know you're going to tell me, I know it did better. <laughs> and you can see while, so an intuitive way to understand that is, so if something happens like the swine flu, so an algorithm calibrated on the last four or five years, will be surprised that things are changing. But if you have something that is just two weeks ago, yeah, it can follow any trend. It has a delay, yes, it has a bias, but it is much more flexible. And it's also much more cheaper and much more transparent and people can actually use it. So I want to take an, I want to take an example that has been been on my mind because I've gotten some Twitter fights over it, and that's uh, the question of whether, and I have friends who, who wonder about this, worrying about it, whether you should have children or not. And on Twitter, people told me that we should, we should do a poll of people who have children, see how happy they are, and, um, and we should do a poll of people who didn't have children and see how happy they are, and then we can find out whether it's having children is good or not. And I thought, and said, I, I don't think that's a very effective way to find out whether you should have children. Um, you're going to be a different person after you have a child. People lie on surveys like that. They want to confirm their decisions and feel good about them. Uh, your best bet to figure out whether you should have children is probably to read some books and cultural discussions about 
what it's like to have children, to get a feel for it. Talk to some friends who have children and see what they think of it. And then um, probably just rely on the heuristic that human beings have children. <laughs> it's part of the human experience. I wouldn't even probably do a cost-benefit analysis at all. But if you're going to do a cost-benefit analysis, don't fool yourself into thinking that a survey is going to give you information. And one of the responses I got uh, more than once, uh, and it happens on related issues, is, well, more information is always better. And yet you disagree with that. So um, react to that claim in that context, if you want, or in some other context. More information is not always better. Now, the real question is, when is it better? So again, the distinction between the risk and uncertainty can help. It's an old distinction that goes back to Frank Knight, yep. to others, and Keynes and uh, Savage and most um, decision theorists had made this distinction. It's just ignored most of the time. So in a world of risk, you can fine tune and that means more information is always better if you forget the costs hmm, and the time that you spend. In a world of uncertainty, that doesn't hold. And even if you forget the time and costs. So we have shown for a number of heuristics that they do better if you have only a certain amount of information that doesn't mean no information, something in between. And uh, one can understand that again, if one goes into statistics, into uh, theories like the bias variance dilemma, which exactly make you understandable why a certain reduction of information can be helpful. So, for instance, the recognition heuristic, you just go by name recognition. Uh, it, uh, it's a mathematical model where you can see that if you are semi-ignorant, you may do much better. A simple example is, so when, uh, so I'll, let me test you on a simple trivia question. Which German city has more inhabitants Bielefeld or Hanover? What do you say? So I've read your book. Uh, and okay. I, so I know what I, – no, I don't know that exact answer to that one. I think you may have given it, but I don't remember that. But I do remember the heuristics. So I'm going to rely on it right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th the first example was Bielefeld. And the other one is Hanover. And I've never heard Hanover. of Bielefeld. So the yeah. odds are, Take unless there was a nuclear accident in Hanover, and that's why I've heard of it, which there hasn't been. Yeah. I'm so, going with Hanover. How would I do? Yeah. And you're right. Oh, phew. good. <laughs> and uh, you're right because you're semi-ignorant. Right, I have no idea. I've not heard of yeah. Bielefeld, have heard of Hanover, and used the recognition heuristic. Now ask Germans who have heard about both. Hmm? And you will find the Germans, many of them, they don't know. And they get it wrong. So this is just an example of, of a very specific mechanism that you can analyze mathematically and you can make predictions and what level of ignorance is actually better than knowing more. There are also other reasons why ignorance can help. There's an entire research field about deliberate ignorance. So for instance, would you like to know when you die? Some people want, but 90% don't. Or if you're married, would you like to know whether you're Marriage ends in divorce. Very few want to know that. And if you would know, you would lead a, a life like Cassandra, uh, the, uh, who could see the future, and the future was not a nice one. And that destroyed her entire life. So uh, more is always better is an illusion. More is sometimes better. And it's better when you are in a situation where the past is like the future and the future like the past. Yeah. Um, you use an example in the book I, I use also of a body scan. Surely it would be better to find out if you have any tumors growing right now in your body. And the answer is no, it's not. There will be a lot of false positives. You will not sleep well yeah. at night. And it's amazing. That this is this is a very important point. It seems like just a like a cheap debating point, but I think it's incredibly important for how we live our lives. It's easy to say to someone, well, 
if you get a bunch of tumors on the full body scan, don't worry about it because they're probably false positives. So don't don't let it haunt your sleep at night. You, you just ignore it. <clears throat> we can't ignore that. We're not good at that as human beings. And recognizing that is very important. And that's an ex- another example why sometimes ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good point, false positives. So the information, so this, this saying, more information is always better, also assumes that the information is true. <laughs> that no fact, huh? But it's most of the time not the case. Yeah. There are misses, there are false alarms. And particularly in medicine, so in screening where uh, a disease is rare, like HIV, there are lots of false positives even in such good tests like HIV. And if you do uh, mammography screening or prostate cancer, PSA screening, most result, most positive results are false. And people need a little bit of statistical education here to understand that. And if the, uh, since the, uh, the, uh, an, art- an article by the, the colleague you mentioned, I think, Prasad, um, argued that there is no single cancer, uh, cancer did, uh, screening method where we have proof that the total mortality is being reduced. Incredibly so then, depressing, yeah. But it, I think you unfortunately think true. Twice. Yeah. It you can call this depressing. You can also call this relieving because liberating. it brings liberating. Yes, it it. Uh, I, I know many men and women. Who have been, uh, uh, have been, who were going screening a positive result, and then it turned out it wasn't really positive, or maybe, not. and they uh, are in cycles, and their life is around mammography or PSA tests, and in some of them, the life is more or less the quality of life is destroyed. If you understand that this type of screening has little hope for benefits, but lots for harms, then you better do something. You do real prevention, for instance, stop smoking, uh, don't drink too much alcohol, and move your body around. (laughs) Yeah, lose some weight, ideally, don't eat too much. Um, Of course, listeners, you should consult your own physicians for decisions along these lines, but we have had many guests who've made similar points and uh it's interesting how hard it is to stop gathering those kinds of pieces of information uh when i tell people i've i've told this before but when i tell my doctor i don't want the psa exam for my prostate uh in, in the blood work that he does uh often the lab does it anyway they i think they make money on it i'm not paying for it yeah. out of pocket uh i don't want it because i don't want to be un, un- scared incorrectly but it just sometimes happens anyway um and uh, i think the system is so geared toward precaution and for a whole bunch of economic reasons that you happen to mention in the book we don't need to go into them now but it's uh one other thing i want to mention is um a term that's come up a few times recently here which i think is very useful which is the chesterton fence and if we keep bringing it up it may have to be added to the econ talk drinking game uh, but the Chester fence is this idea that you come across a fence in the middle of the of a field and you think, well, this looks just like it gets in the way. I'm going to tear it down. And you don't know why it's there. And when you tear it down, you find out it had a purpose, but it doesn't make sense to you. And so you just decide it must be irrational. And many heuristics, many rules of thumb are like that. They've evolved over time. They're consistent with the way our brain works. And yet as uh, arrogant experts, we often say, oh, well, this just must be a mistake. And we we change policy or or make decisions accordingly. And I think uh, a respect for some traditions is incredibly important, and it's a way to access information you wouldn't otherwise get. Another concept that we could add to the econ talk is defensive decision making. That is, a decision maker, like a doctor, does not recommend the patient what he or she, the doctor, thinks it's the best to do, but something second best. Why would doctors do that? And defensive decision-making is done in order to protect yourself as a doctor from the patient 
uh, who might sue you if something happens. And that usually leads to unnecessary imaging, to unnecessary cancer screenings, to unnecessary antibiotica, and just mostly done too much, too much, too much, too much. Uh, in the studies in the US, uh, doctors typically say, so when doctors are asked, about 90 to 95% of them say, yes, that's what I'm doing and I have no choice. Yeah. So it's very important that a patient is aware of that situation in which the doctor is. Because the patient is the problem. It's the patient who sues or the lawyer that runs around. And so this kind of structural understanding is very important. Sometimes a simple heuristic helps here. So uh, don't ask your doctor what he or she recommends to you, but ask the doctor what she would recommend to her own brother or sister or mother. The mother wouldn't sue. And I typically uh, have gotten a very different answer to both of these questions. Yeah, I think after a while, doctors get better at ignoring the fact that they say it's their mother or sister but or brother, but... <laughs> but it is. I do ask that question all the time, uh, and mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly um, – it's important because I, it forces a doctor to step out of an unconscious mode of thought, their own heuristic uh, of, of precaution uh, and safety, and it forces them to at least recognize the possibility that what they're recommending may not always be so good for the patient. They can mm -hmm. still lie, of course. But I think a lot of the wrong decisions that doctors make are not consciously done in any, you know, unpleasant way. It's the when you're holding the hammer, you're looking for nails. You start to forget that uh, you've got a hammer in your hand all the time, and everything looks like a nail. And if you remind someone to say, "Well, gee, that's a that's a wine glass. That's not a nail, isn't it?" and they might go, "Oh, oh yeah, you're right. I won't I won't hammer on this one." So I, I think the it's natural that surgeons like surgery. And dentists like filling cavities and so on. Uh, and many times, of course, it's a good idea, but sometimes it's not always a good idea. And it's good to be cautious in that direction, too. Yes. So, um, well, what else are we going to talk about? Well, I want to I start with, I want to talk about an example you start with in the book, which I think is extremely important for economics. And it's come up in a number of different contexts here. And you're talking about a very simple act in sports, which is catching a ball that's mm -hmm. either thrown in the air or hit in a yeah. baseball by a batter. And you have a fabulous quote from Richard Dawkins, who's a scientific man. And he says the following. When a man throws a ball high in the air and catches it again, he behaves as if he had solved a set of differential equations in predicting the trajectory of the ball. He may neither know nor care what a differential equation is, but this does not affect his skill with the ball. At some subconscious level, something functionally equivalent to the mathematical calculations are going on. Now, uh, this is in economics all the time. It comes from a famous article by Milton Friedman we've referenced here before on um, methodology in economics where he advances a very similar argument, the as-if argument. It's called in economics. People act as if they're maximizing utility, as if they're doing this, that, or the other. Now, Models are to help us understand the world. They're also to help us predict the world. And a model can be very effective at predicting, even though it's a very poor description. This example is pretty good at predicting. It's absolutely wrong as a description. It is not what people do. They do not calculate differential equations in their head. And in, on the surface, you could say, well, who cares? It's just a model. The problem is, in economics, and I suspect elsewhere, and Paul Flaterer in an episode here talked about this at great length, economists start to confuse the two all the time. They start to think, well, my model has been confirmed by the data, therefore my model is reality. And in particular, an example might be, if the minimum wage in this particular data set doesn't uh, reduce employment, then I know that there's what's called monopsony power, because that's one of the predictions of monopsony, is that a minimum wage won't have the effect it might normally have. But that's not that doesn't follow at all. In fact, you've learned nothing about the structure of the labor market. 
uh, in, in that particular one study example. And yet economists constantly conflate their models with the underlying process of reality. And it's just not true. Yeah. The, um, the example you gave about the um, baseball player, so the baseball player use so the outfielder uses a uh, very simple heuristic that's called the gaze heuristic it works if the ball is up in the air and the heuristic has three steps namely fixate your eye on the ball start running and then adjust your running speed so that the angle of gaze remains constant try it and you will be exactly there where the ball is coming down no calculations of uh, trajectories are needed. All the information that's in such an equation to calculate the trajectory of the ball is can be ignored. It's again a heuristic that relies on one single powerful cue, the angle of gaze. And the here we have a, a this is, I call this a process model. It's still a model. Because people may do something slightly different, yeah? but it describes what's usually being done. And also it allows us to predict better than the as-if model of a trajectory calculation. For instance, if you understand the process, we understand why players change the speed while running yeah? in order to keep the angle constant. If you have a trajectory model, then you would assume the player is trying to run as fast as he can to the point where the ball is supposed to come down and then may final adjustments. It's not the case. It also explains why people run into the ball, uh, why players run there, because they don't know where it's coming down. They have a heuristic to catch it, not to predict where it's coming down. Uh, uh, understanding good models of the process is also important, not only because it explains how it's being done, so the causal process, but also it can help people to teach others to make better decisions. Uh, one great example is the miracle on the Hudson River. You may recall that a plane started in LaGuardia Airport and a few minutes later something totally unexpected happened, a flock of Canadian geese uh, flew into the plane, into both engines, and they turned down. And the pilots had to make an important decision. Can they make it back to an airport, or should they have to take the risk to go into the Hudson River? How did they find out whether they can make it back to the airport? No, they didn't do any calculations of their trajectories, they use the same heuristic, the gaze heuristic, but now consciously, that baseball players usually use unconsciously. And the heuristic then is fixate, say, the tower of the uh, airport through your windshield, and if the tower is going up, then you won't make it. You will hit in <laughs> before. And uh, Skiles, the co-pilot, uh, of the plane is explicit that I use this heuristic. So this is an example uh, which also uh, dispels the myth that heuristics would be unconscious, like in a so-called system one. It's not true. Every heuristic that I studied can be used unconsciously, like most baseball players do this, and consciously, like the pilots, they're trained. And it also shows that these simple heuristics can increase safety. And also, of course, they save time. Uh, this is one of the big values of going away from as if model to studying the decision making process. I want to ask you about um, yeah. a different use, which is uh, nudging and sometimes called libertarian paternalism. Um, you give a number of examples in the book of how people behave very differently when they have to opt in versus opt out. A very powerful example you give of a, a group of, of police in, in the middle of World War II were told to go and kill women and children, Jewish women and children, 
And their commander says, if anyone's uncomfortable with this, take a step forward. And only a handful of people opt out and take that step forward. And you suggest that if the commander had said, uh, who is comfortable doing this, take a step forward, only a few people would have stepped forward. And it may have even stopped this this thing from happening that was deeply uh, horrible. So a lot of people have pointed this out. Uh, you have a couple other examples in the book. But a lot of people point this out and say, well, we need the government to make opt-in and opt-out decisions to do the right thing, whether it's kidney donations, uh, say an organ donor card in, in, in filling out your driver's license, uh, or savings. Uh, we should make savings mandatory so you can allow to opt out, so you're still free. The government's not coercing you, but the government should choose uh, the options that are, that are best in order to overcome these natural biases we have toward passivity, that, that opting out in is often difficult. So let's make opting in, uh, uh, make opting out the, the, the thing that's bad. And yeah. so uh, you imply, and you wrote the book in 2008, uh, you seem to suggest that that would be a good thing. And yet I know you've written since then an article that you don't like nudging. So how, how do you resolve those? Mm. So um, I'm not a fan of nudging as a policy of governments. First, the question is, what government? So is it Obama or Trump that nudges you? And second, I bet much more on informing people and make them risk savvy rather than steer them like sheep. The meanwhile, there are now studies on the on the organ donation uh, problem, opt in, opt out. It is true that you get more potential donors if it's opt-in and opt-out. But the question is, do you actually get more actual donors? And the new studies that have come out, uh, they show that the, act the opt-in versus opt-out difference makes little difference. Hmm. So most of the differences between countries are due to the organization uh, to the uh, incentives for doctors and to many other things. Um, on nudging in general, uh, I mean, nudging is nothing new. It's basically the methods that marketing and others have used before to influence us. And uh, what we really need in the 21st century is people who understand what's being done to them. People who are risk literate, who are health literate, who are able to deal with money and who are also able to control the digital media. We need to invest in making people stronger. This is my view. We don't need more paternalism in the 20th century. Sorry, we don't need more paternalism in the 21st century. I think, we had enough last one. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But I think the paternalists would argue, well, that's all well and good for you, Gerd, and, and for the even maybe the host of Econ Talk, who, who, despite his limitations, might be able to acquire some of this wisdom you think we can improve on. But most people, they're not smart enough to become risk literate. That, that's, un, that's unrealistic. We have to help them. <laughs> okay. Um, most people who make bad decisions don't, in my experience, make bad decisions because something is misfired in their brain. That's the usual take of the nudging people. But because there's an industry who sells them products that are unhealthy, there is a a tobacco industry who sells some cigarettes that are unhealthy, and so it goes on. And to nudge people, meaning using the same methods against big industry, has little prospects. The uh, it's also nudging is based on a certain uh, group of psychologists and behavioral economists who want to point out that everyone else is somehow stupid. So uh, the term isn't used, but the term lack of rationality is used. Mm. Many of these experiments that claim that people make wrong decisions are typically uh, paper and pencil experiments have been shown in the last decades already to be 
doubtful or to be refuted, or that the statistical errors that uh, John Q. Public allegedly commits are actually errors of the researchers. That literature, which is brought in psychology, is, is not well known in behavioral economics. I've written a paper called The Bias Bias in Behavioral Economics. That is, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the tendency to find biases even if there are none. And it would be well done to uh, realize that people aren't so stupid. They can be seduced, yes. But the most of the arguments are about people's probability judgments, uh, intuitions about chains and so on. And these intuitions are fairly good. And that psychological research has documented since decades. And a few studies who claim the opposite, uh, they are featured. That's part of the bias bias. I can give you a simple example. <clears throat> Let's go back to doctors. And I take this example from the Nudge book by Thaler and Sunstein. So, you suffer from a severe heart condition and you think about a dangerous operation. You ask your doctor about the prospect. So, the doctor could say, you have a 90% chance to survive. Or she could say, you have a 10% chance to die. So, the first one is called the positive, the next one, the negative framing. So, Dick Thaler and Cass Sunstein are the opinion that you shouldn't listen the way the doctor frames the message because it's logically the same. But people are intuitive psychologists and they listen. And also studies have shown that doctors choose a frame depending what they want to recommend. So if a doctor tells you you have a 90% chance to survive, that's a recommendation and most people understand that. And if the doctor tells you you have a 10% chance to die, that's not a recommendation to do the surgery and most people understand that. This is not an error. It may look logically the same, but it's not psychologically the same. And people intuitively understand that. And framing is typically interpreted by ordinary people as a recommendation. And this is by itself not an error to be corrected. I think it's a very deep point, actually. Um, the general point is that you said it a slightly different way, but a lot of times what we're testing is the researcher's logic, not the not the uh, yeah. su subjects, because language is inherently amb ambiguous, and it's not. You have a number of examples in the book. I encourage uh, listeners to get the book and check it out. But people, when they run an experiment, assume that language is is uh, like math. It's not like math at all. Mm. It's very different, yeah. and that's uh, in fact culturally we have evolved, as you point out many times in the book, our brain has evolved to read those cues very subtly and they're not ran, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not just uh, uh, like flipping a coin between whether it's uh, uh, 90 or 10. They're not the same. Mm, yeah. Yes. The brain evolved to deal with uncertainty, not with situations of risk, not with lotteries. And the brain is amazing in taking up the subtle cues. And that's in the same way also a way to mislead the brain. But in the first place, the brain would not work well if it would just think logically. And language understanding, language is ambiguous. There's uh, many terms have several meanings and people immediately understand what it is. So Context another is so example. Important. Context is so important example. also as well. And the idea that people make decisions about money in, in some sort of laboratory setting is, of course, ridiculous. Yeah. Markets provide information that aren't available in the lab. And Vernon Smith has, I think, been very eloquent and correct on yeah. this. But mm -hmm. carry on. Sorry. Yeah. 
I'll just give you another example of some of these studies. So uh, one of the so-called cognitive illusion is called the conjunction fallacy. So the idea is that some, some event cannot be more likely that the same event and another event together. So the end is, so for instance, the famous Linda problem. So if you say Linda, so the story goes something like that. Uh, so you are subjects, you read Linda is uh, uh, Linda is active in the uh, feminist movement. She is 31 years old and uh, blah, other things. Yeah. And then you ask, what is more probable? Linda is a bank teller. And you got no cue that she could be a bank teller. Or Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. Now you got some cues that she's active in the feminist movement. So most people say the latter is right. Now Kahneman, Tversky said wrong. Hmm? Because the probability of an event like she's a bank teller cannot be higher than the event and another event. That's the conjunction law. Hmm? What's being overlooked by my dear colleagues is that language is polysemous. An end has many meanings and people are very smart to find out what it is. Just to give you an example, uh, when I say this evening I invented friends and colleagues, you understand what I mean and you don't think it's the conjunction, so the intersection, only friends who are also colleagues. Hmm? It's the logical or. And this kind of intelligence that we have intuitively, we can't even describe how we do this in this way. This is one of the hallmarks of human intelligence. It's the most difficult to teach uh, an algorithm or a computer to think in this way, to make these inferences that people have. It's easy for a computer or to teach him to think logically. But logical thinking is simple compared to the intelligence that people have. So let's close with a little bit of um, maybe some caution. Um, when I say things like the things I've said on the program today about, say, regression analysis or the reliability of cost-benefit analysis or big data, I'm often accused of being anti-science. And I, I respond by saying, no, I'm anti-bad science. I'm not anti-science. I love science. Science is a beautiful thing. It's just that we have to understand its lim limitations. Otherwise, it becomes the equivalent of a religion. And Similarly, in our conversation today, I think people, if they're not careful, can say, oh, I just have to go with my gut. Now, we talked a little bit about it before, but talk a little bit. Let's close with, with some thoughts on the fact that sometimes heuristics are dangerous, and sometimes it's hard to know where to find the heuristic or the, fr the first thing to put in that fast and frugal tree. Um, I'll never forget a story, a story I've told her before about the CEO who – company went bankrupt and I asked him what went wrong. He said, oh, I chose the wrong case study. He was a Harvard MBA. He had, he had been trained in the case study method. And in some dimension, yeah. case studies are heuristics. They're to give you a set of temp. It's, a, it's a, a taxonomy of how to make decisions rather than a formal analytical technique. And he'd fallen uh, from, from grace because he had chosen the wrong rule of thumb. He'd picked the wrong case study. So give us some wisdom on how to be careful and not go too far in the other direction. Yeah. I think the, uh, the first step is to distinguish between situations of risk and uncertainty. In situations of risk, then do your calculations. It's also the, the world where uh, big data is most promising and also the world of uh, machine learning. So... Uh, and it assumes a stable world. The, the more you have to do with situations of uncertainty, the more you need to simple, simplify and to make things more robust because you cannot know how the future will be. It is correct what you said that heuristics can fail, but they also can be excellent. 
And the important question is to use them in the right situation. For instance, in situations of uncertainty. And we have studied in much detail for most heuristics that we have investigated what is the ecological rationality of the heuristic. It's also a term that Vernon Smith has used in his noble speech. And the ecological rationality is exactly the question, I have a tool, what is the situation where it will likely work and where not? And we also should not forget that analytic methods, including uh, statistical methods that are used all the time, can uh, lead to excellent results, but also to total failures. This is nothing specific about heuristics. Just uh, recall value at risk calculations before the uh, financial crisis of 2008 or the uh, models of rating agencies and most of these models have the following type. They do maybe a Bayesian updating or some other updating based on maybe five years of data. What can they do or could they do before 2008? It was going up all the time. And so the models could only predict it will go up further. That's called the turkey illusion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's like the situation of a turkey who is fed every day. And every day the probability that it will be fed and not be killed increases until the day 100, which is the day before Thanksgiving. He was not in a world of <laughs> uh, calculable risk. So, uh, the important point is, it's often said heuristics can do well, but they can fail. But it's almost never said that Bayesian analysis can do well or fail, or that value at risk can do well or fail. It is whatever tool we use, if it's a heuristic, if it's a fast or frugal tree, for example, or if it's some analytical calculation, it's a tool that is a good tool for a certain type of environment and a bad tool for another one. A hammer needs a nail, but not a screwdriver. My guest today has, ber has been Gerd Gigerenzer. His book is Gut Feelings. We'll put up links to a lot of the papers he's mentioned and to some others. Gerd, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you. It was a pleasure. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for EconTalk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.